Brothers and sisters, this morning we will ponder the plans of the Lord through the text that we have received in Isaiah 40, the verses 9 through 11. We'll read those words again. Isaiah 40, verse 9 to 11, is the words of Isaiah the prophet. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever wondered what it would be like to meet someone from the Bible? Perhaps one of the Old Testament saints who lived in a world so very different from our own? Adam or Eve, perhaps Abraham, Job, Ruth or Esther, perhaps King David or King Solomon. Now, if you happen to cross paths with any of these, you would probably recognize them for who they were. Many of them were prominent people in their time. But what about John the Baptist? If you found yourself wandering around in the wilderness of Judea, and you met a man who looked like John, who sounded like John, who spoke like John, what would you think? Would you recognize how important he was in God's plan for the world? In the Gospels, John is described in vivid terms. In fact, the New Testament makes something of a spectacle of his appearance. His appearance is mentioned in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark. And Jesus himself in Luke, in Luke 7, verse 24, he draws our attention to John's appearance. He says there, what did you expect? Of a man living in the desert, who did you expect to see? A man wearing fine clothes? Now, as we read, John wore a garment of camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. You see, John, already in his appearance, John challenged Jewish expectations, and he defied Roman views or understandings, Roman pomp and ceremony. You see, it was not a wise old Pharisee who had prepared the way for the Messiah. It was not a well-dressed, a very important, impressive-looking Roman herald proclaiming the next king. No, it was a prophet, a prophet in the wilderness, A man who was rather rough around the edges, unrefined, unpresentable. You see, the arrival of the king of kings was announced by a man dressed in camel's hair. This was the messenger that God appointed to be a herald. A herald of the kingdom of God. A rather unexpected messenger of comfort and of hope. Just like the city of Jerusalem in our text. You see, through this this prophecy in Isaiah, God comforts his chosen city. And he then, he commissions her to bring a message to the surrounding cities in Judah. Jerusalem, a broken and despised and desolate city, would become a herald of God's salvation. A herald bringing a message of reconciliation and restoration and hope. A herald of hope to the surrounding cities. And so the comforted city will become a messenger, a herald of comfort. This is our theme for this morning. We will pay attention to two points. First, we will consider the unlikely herald, the city itself, the city of Jerusalem. And then we will consider the message that she brought, the resounding message. So first, we'll pay attention to the herald, the city, 
of Jerusalem. Our chapter this afternoon, chapter 40, it begins what is a new prophecy in the book of Isaiah. In this chapter, it's the first in a new series of oracles. You see, the book of Isaiah, it can be split into two parts. The first part, this is chapters 1 through 35, it, it deals mainly with contemporary issues. These are, these are the prophecies where, I, where Isaiah addresses the world in which he lived. Prophecies that were written about the specific nations and the specific rulers who lived during the time of Isaiah. And these prophecies, they warned God's people about events that would soon come to pass, even within their own lifetime. Events that would happen according to the righteous judgment of God. This is the main theme of the first part of this book. From his throne in heaven, a holy God, he sees the sin of the world. And he plans to intervene. He plans to rise up like a just and a righteous king to bring a terrible judgment. First against the sins of his people, the people of of Israel and Judah. And then against all the surrounding nations to include every nation on earth. We read this especially in chapters 24 and chapters 34. And Isaiah himself lived through the fulfillment of many of these prophecies. Many of these, they refer to the Assyrians. And in the 8th century BC, the Assyrian Empire, it it rose to power and it destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And then after the first part of this book, there are four chapters that form an interlude. These are the chapters 36 through 39, which we read this morning. Here we have two short narratives, similar to what we find in the book of two kings, the second book of kings, kings 19 and 20. And these narratives, they're set within a particular context. You see, both narratives, they recall a special deliverance that was worked by God. And both narratives, they focus our attention now on the city of Jerusalem, A special city, a single city in the nation of Judah, God's chosen city. You see that first historical account? These are the chapters 36 and 37. They they describe a national deliverance. The same Assyrian army which had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel was now encamped on the very doorstep, the doorstep of Jerusalem. The city, it stands alone. It stands helpless. That's chapter 36, verse 1. Jerusalem is the last city standing. And there is no earthly help. There is no earthly hope for deliverance. Their destruction is certain. But then God intervenes. In mercy, He comes to rescue His people. As He had promised in Isaiah 29, verse 1 through 8, He destroys the Assyrian army and he saves Jerusalem. And they are, in a manner of speaking, they are given new life. The second account, this is chapters 38 through 39, it describes what is a personal deliverance. First, a national deliverance, now a personal deliverance. The, The king of Judah, Hezekiah, Hezekiah of the line of David, he becomes very sick. He had received A sentence of death, the disease running its course, would soon take his life. And again, there is no earthly hope for deliverance, for restoration. But then in his mercy and in response to heartfelt prayer, God restores Hezekiah to life and to health. He even added 15 years to his life. This is a remarkable restoration. This is a testament of God's mercy. Hezekiah is given, quite literally, he is given new life. And he responds in thankfulness. Chapter 38, it ends quite wonderfully. It ends with a song that is written by Hezekiah. And in this song, Hezekiah, he praises God for his restoration. And he pledges himself, as you can read in verse 20, chapter 28, sorry, 38, verse 20, he pledges himself to the honor of the Lord. He says there, the Lord will save me and we will play my music on stringed instruments every day of our lives in the house of the Lord. 
But then notice how Hezekiah's story ends. The beginning, at the beginning of chapter 39, we read that Hezekiah, he used this new life that he had received to honor himself rather than God. Beloved, as, as it is recorded in Isaiah, God, he demonstrates his mercy twice. He twice works a remarkable deliverance. Twice he teaches his people to trust in him alone. God had delivered them, if we think of the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 10. God had delivered them from a deadly peril, and he would deliver them again. But as was so often the case in the history of God's people, Hezekiah, he did not honor God according to the mercy that he had received. He began again to rely on himself, seeking security in foreign alliances, trusting in his own influence, trusting in his own prestige, his own wealth. And so God's wrath falls against Hezekiah. It falls against Jerusalem. This is described clearly in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 25. And Isaiah then brings another message of judgment. And this time, the message is for Jerusalem herself. Jerusalem, the city of God, delivered from the Assyrians, would then be destroyed by the Babylonians. And her people would be taken into captivity. Jerusalem, that city on a hill, would be broken, would be put to fire. It would be emptied of her people and her princes. Her walls would be leveled. The temple would be destroyed. And she would be utterly despised and rejected. She would become a spectacle for all to see. This is how chapter 39 ends. But now in the second part of this book, this is chapter 40 to 66, Isaiah brings another prophecy, this time about events that are far in the future, not the near future, but far in the future. And in these chapters, he looks even beyond the destruction of Jerusalem. You see, these prophecies, they are different. They are wonderfully different from the prophecies that came before because they, res they resound with words of reconciliation, words of restoration, words of return. The main theme now is not judgment, it's comfort. In Isaiah 40, the verses 1 through 2, Isaiah the prophet, he receives a glimpse, a glimpse of God's wonderful plan for the future. Verse 1 puts the words of God right beside the secret thoughts of Hezekiah. You see, Hezekiah, he thinks only of himself and his time. He is a man. He is in time. He thinks of his days. He doesn't think about the future of his people or the future of his city or even the future of his own children. But the eternal God reveals here in this prophecy, he reveals his concern for the future of his people and his city. And so through Isaiah, he brings a message of future consolation. He sends words of comfort to the coming generation of his covenant people. He says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And brothers and sisters, this is a remarkable testament to the character of our God. He is faithful. He cares about the future of his people. He has plans for his people, plans that include judgment against sin, but plans that do not end in judgment, plans that end in restoration and reconciliation, plans that end in peace. From the beginning to the end, this is Isaiah's message to the people, that God is perfectly just, he is perfectly holy, and he is a God of peace who desires reconciliation with his people. And now with these prophecies, God reveals something of his plan. Many years later, these words of Isaiah, they would encourage the hearts of the people languishing in exile in Babylon, so far from home, 
These words, the Word of God, given through His prophet, would give them hope for the future. They could read these prophecies which were written and had been given to the people. They could read these prophecies and they could look forward to a day of deliverance, a day of return. And because of what these words now reveal about our God, about the covenant faithfulness of our our God, they bring hope to us. You see, this this prophecy is nothing less than the, the steadfast love of God on display. Even before the judgment is experienced, even before repentance is made, God plans a restoration. This is what our, our, our passage reveals. God has a plan. He has a vision for His church, and His plans for His people, they end in peace. As Christians, we can draw incredible comfort from how the Bible ends. You see, the exiles of Jerusalem, they had received these prophecies of Isaiah. We have received the revelation of John, John the Apostle. The final prophecy, the end of the revelation of God's plan of salvation, His vision for the church. And how does it all end? If you turn to the end, how does the Bible end? When was the last time you read Revelation 21 and 22? You see, for God's covenant people, it ends in perfect peace, perfect reconciliation, a perfect restoration. It ends with a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And so the exiles, all those years ago, They experienced an earthly foretaste of the same hope that we have. Because God's plan for the earthly city of Jerusalem, it included a complete restoration. You see, this restoration, it began with what we read in chapter, in the verses 3 through 5. You see, the exiles, they would return. This was the promise of God. They would return back to their home. In fact, Isaiah describes the return of of exile, the exiles, like a second exodus. A highway would be made through the wilderness for the redeemed to return. Mountains are made low. The valleys are lifted up because God himself will go with his people. And this promise that begins in Isaiah, it's filled out by the later prophets. Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The temple would be restored. The Lord would return to dwell in the midst of his people. And the city then would enjoy peace. It would enjoy prosperity. No longer would her streets be empty, as we read in Zechariah 8, verse 4 and 5, but but old men and old women would again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of their great age. And the city would be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. You see, the Lord, He would gather His people together from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, from wherever they had been scattered, and He would draw them back to His city. And then He would come to live with them. He would be their God, and they would be His people. And now coming to verse 9, Jerusalem, comforted by this promise, is instructed to become a messenger, a messenger of good news, this good news to the cities around her. See, one of the remarkable features of our text is that the emphasis is placed firmly on the city of Jerusalem. You see, Isaiah, he addresses the city itself. Jerusalem herself would become a herald of salvation. That broken and despised city would proclaim the most wonderful news for the region of Judea. That very city which would experience the judgment of God, would later become a testament. A testament of His mercy and forgiveness. This is a wonderful illustration of what God would accomplish through His people. They would become a testament of His faithfulness. And through this prophecy, then He he directs them to spread the news of the coming salvation boldly, to proclaim it from the mountains. See, the promise of salvation It's to be received and then believed 
and then shared. Wherever God's people happen to be, this promise, it must be proclaimed so that everyone would know the redemption that God has in store for them. And so, brothers and sisters, we see, hopefully, where John the Baptist fits in all this. God's chosen messengers are not always what we might expect, but they do always come with a message of comfort, a message of hope. The Apostle Paul, he reflects on this often when he considered his own ministry. For example, as we read in his second letter to the Corinthians, in all his afflictions, in all his sufferings, in all his guilt, he had received comfort from the Father of all comfort. And he had received this comfort through the promises of the gospel. And then having experienced this rich comfort, he was able to comfort others with the same message that he had received. This is precisely how the glory of God is revealed through the restoration of broken and despised people. Those who had received mercy from God then become messengers of His mercy to others. See, this mission of Jerusalem, it is the mission of the church to hear and to believe and then to proclaim the gospel promises to proclaim the excellencies of her Savior and the promise of His coming. And like Jerusalem, the church is not perfect. Brothers and sisters, she is in need of mercy. And so she is a strange herald of salvation. The church is despised in this world. She does not submit to worldly standards of wisdom or glory or honor. She is broken often. She is oppressed. And she fights against sin both within and without. And yet, God has appointed His church to be a steward of the gospel, a messenger, a messenger of good news, a treasure beyond compare to share with the world. This is a wonderful commission. Brothers and sisters, we can speak of Jesus Christ with surpassing joy and conviction because we have received, we have tasted that mercy, the mercy through Christ, because we have been reconciled to God. And because we now, we share, we hold on to that hope of glory. You see, we ourselves, we are living examples of His mercy, of His loving kindness. And so this is my hope for you, that your joy that the joy of the redeemed will shine forth. That the joy of your deliverance will shine forth. You have received mercy from God. Your guilt is atoned for. You are reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. And you have received the promise of a complete, a perfect restoration. You see, through the gospel, God comforts you in your distress. So then take every opportunity, brothers and sisters, to comfort others with the same comfort that you have received. Just like the city of Jerusalem so long ago, you have received good news. Good news of great joy. Life-changing news of reconciliation and restoration that is found in Jesus Christ. If you hear and if you believe this good news, then you too are commissioned to be a herald of salvation. See, the church today is like Jerusalem was in the past. Just as Jerusalem was was commanded to proclaim this message of deliverance, the church must proclaim the excellencies of her Savior. We are living examples of the mercies of God, bringing a message that then resounds through the history of His people. This is our second point, a resounding message. Now, in the first point, we we focused closely on the unlikely messenger, that broken and despised city. In our second point, we will consider more, more carefully the message then that she proclaims. This is the second half of our text. Now, as it is translated, as we have it here in the ESV, the message itself, it's only three words. It's the last three words of verse 9 there. The words there that are found We can read, behold, the words are, behold your God. And then what follows in verses 10 and 11, it 
and the rest of the chapter, it fills out this message, the significance. It explains the significance of this message. But the message itself, it's quite simple. Jerusalem is to announce the coming of God. This is the same message of the voice in verse 3. A message that now would resound from Jerusalem to the cities of Judea. Now, the progress of this message is a little bit difficult to follow in this chapter. This is, this is a poetic prophecy. You see, God speaks in verse 1, as we can read. And then a voice cries out there, as it says in verse 3. A voice cries out in verse 3. And then another voice speaks in verse 6. This voice is the prophet as he responds with the same words. And then Zion is directed to cry out from on top of the mountain, the high mountain. The whole passage, you could say, it's written like a series of echoes. A series of echoes that resound in our ears. The same basic message, it travels from messenger to messenger. Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes. This is the message. Now notice, first of all, that this is a very personal message. It's not simply the king is coming or God comes, but he says, your God, your God comes. He is, in verse 10, announced with his personal name, the name Yahweh. He is their God. He is the same God who had redeemed the people from Egypt, who had carried them through the wilderness and brought them into the promised land. Your God comes. And how does he come? He comes there, as we see, he comes with strength, he comes with compassion. This is the image of God we have in the verses 10 through 11. God comes with the strength of a warrior and with the tender care of a shepherd. Verse 10 begins by describing his might. The meaning here is quite clear. The Almighty God, he cannot be hindered, he cannot be stopped, he cannot be prevented. Nothing can prevent his arrival. There is no mountain too high. There is no valley too low. There is no desert too vast. No obstacle can stand before him. He will have his way. The expression that is used here in verse 10, the beginning of verse 10, he shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule before him. This, it's a reference to the power of God that is used on behalf of his people. You see, God, He will accomplish His plan. He will accomplish His purpose with His people as He has done in the past. This is how God reveals Himself, as we saw through. This is how God reveals His faithfulness and His strength through acts of salvation that are worked on behalf of His people. Now, the second expression in verse 10, there where it says, His recompense is before Him. His reward is with him. His recompense is before him. This is a bit more difficult to understand because the same English word is used to translate a number of different Hebrew words. For example, in chapter 35, verse 4, the prophet speaks there directly to the exiles. He says, be strong. He says, fear not. Behold, your God comes with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Now, the emphasis in chapter 35 is deliverance, deliverance from exile. God will come. He will come, as it were, to Babylon. He will come to rescue his people and bring vengeance on his enemies. But now in chapter 40, verse 10, the same English word is used for a slightly different Hebrew word, and it's placed in parallel with the word reward. His reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. Here in chapter 40, the word that is used, it has more to do with the outcome, with the product of his work. And the work in view is restoration, the restoration of Jerusalem and the surrounding cities. God comes, he comes to restore Jerusalem. And he does this, he does this with the people themselves. He restores Jerusalem by leading his people safely to the city. A desolate city is restored by by her missing people. The product of God's work here in view in this chapter, the product of God's work is the people themselves, a redeemed people, 
They are his reward. They are his precious possession to be returned to his chosen city. This is reinforced by the image that follows. This is one of the only places in the Old Testament we read something like this. That God is with his people and they are before him like a sheep, like sheep are gathered before a shepherd. God is described as a shepherd, a shepherd who sometimes leads, sometimes follows, but always directs his flock where he wants them to go. And in this particular case, to Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. This is the wonderful illustration of verse 11. God is like a shepherd, a good shepherd, a shepherd who who carefully tends to his flock. Is he a good shepherd? He keeps his flock together. He gathers them together. Although some sheep may feel inclined to go their own way, a shepherd encourages, sometimes enforces the unity of his flock. And a good shepherd, he knows his flock. He knows each one. He knows their weaknesses. He knows their injuries. He knows their individual tendencies and inclinations. He knows their character and their personalities. And he knows their, each of them, he knows their special circumstances. Each one, the young and the old, he is attentive to their specific needs, the weak and the helpless, the lame, the exhausted ones, those, those who are leading young, as it says. And he deals then with each one in accordance with their situation as it seems best to him, leaving none behind, but bringing each and every one of his sheep to safe pasture. And a shepherd has plans for his sheep. He knows what is best for them. He is the shepherd. They are only sheep. And so he directs them where he wants them to go. You see, this this is a wonderful illustration. This is a picture of loving kindness and patience. The Almighty, the eternal God, He has a heart of a shepherd, which is directed to the welfare of His people. He is full of compassion. You see, for the exiles awaiting redemption in Babylon, this is a powerful image of a faithful and a loving Father, one who has all things in hand. The God of all comfort, He promises to lead them home to bring them back to Jerusalem. In the poetic language of our text, this is the message that Jerusalem is to proclaim to the cities of Judah. God is coming. Prophets and heralds go before him, repeating the same message, announcing his arrival. God is coming. He is coming to deliver his people. He will gather his people from far off lands and lead them back to the promised land where they're they will once again inhabit the cities that stand empty. Now, long after Isaiah prophesied these words, this prophecy was confirmed in the restoration of Judah, in part. During the reign of Cyrus, God, as we can read in in the the post-exilic books, during the reign of Cyrus, God stirred up a remnant from Babylon to resettle in the land of Israel. He turned the hearts of the king. He gave them every opportunity and they they rose up and they settled back in the land of Israel. They rebuilt what had been destroyed. First Jerusalem and then all the cities that surrounded her. They were restored and they were re-inhabited. And so Jerusalem herself, that actual city on a hill, it became a testament, a visible sign of the loving kindness of her covenant God. She became a herald preparing the nation of Israel for the coming of her true king. God himself, Emmanuel, because as we know from the New Testament, as we read in Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, this prophecy was ultimately fulfilled in the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God came. He came to the, to the world. He came as a man to save his people from the judgment that stood against them. And he was announced. He was announced by the resounding voices of the Old Testament. Countless prophets repeating the same basic message 
a message that was repeated through the ages until at last the voice of John the Baptist would ring out over the wilderness of Judea and lead the people to Jesus. He is the good shepherd, as he describes himself in John 10. In the person of Jesus, you see God's compassion clothed in human flesh. In the person of Jesus, like nowhere else, you see the compassionate heart of God directed towards his people. He is the good shepherd who cares for his sheep, laying down his life for his sheep so that they could live and prosper. And he gathers them, he gathers them, he brings them together from all places around the world into one fold, one flock, one church. And brothers and sisters, who is like our God? In the person of Jesus Christ, God himself is the shepherd of his church. Just as he is an eternal God, he is an eternal shepherd. Gathering and defending not only the people of Judah back to the city Jerusalem in the 6th century BC, but gathering and defending his entire church throughout all time. Through wars, through tribulations, through oppression, through disease, through the consequences of sin, he leads his people through it all, not leaving any behind. So you can trust in his care over you and in his care over his church. He is almighty, he is strong to save, and he is eternal. And he is our God, and he has plans for his church, wonderful plans. If through faith in him we have peace and we have perfect security and we can be assured that like the people of Jerusalem, we can be assured that even before we experience trials and difficulties in this life, God has our consolation in mind. Beloved, this is the wonderful message of our passage. Our God, he comforts his church with the promise of deliverance so that she can bring this message of comfort to others, so that the redeemed of the Lord can become heralds of salvation. And this message then that we receive in faith, we pass on with joy and with thankfulness and with heartfelt conviction. We are redeemed. And now, just like the exiles returning to the land of Judah, we have a part to play in God's plan of salvation. In God's great work. And so we proclaim. Every day we proclaim the excellencies of our Savior. So that the glory of God might be revealed to the whole world. And then when we proclaim this good news of deliverance. Just like Isaiah. And just like the redeemed people of Jerusalem. And just like John the Baptist. Then we prepare the world to meet. To receive her King. You see, we become heralds of God, announcing His return. This is exactly what we read in Revelation 22, verse 12. These are the words of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, to John. He says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each for what He has done. And then verse 17, that same resounding message, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And the one who hears says, come. Beloved, our God is coming again. The Alpha and the Omega, the everlasting God in the person of Jesus Christ with his recompense before him in strength and in tenderness. He is coming again. Just as God came for the exiles in Babylon, Christ comes for us. He is coming as the righteous judge over his enemies, and he is coming as the shepherd of his sheep, to gather all people before him, leaving none behind, leading them through the gates of the new Jerusalem. Amen.